welcome back, everybody, and another episode of On the Delo. And I am excited today because my friend Corey is here. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Um, well, thank you for having me. I really well, appreciate it. Push that a little bit closer. All right, I'll get it closer here. Here hear, we go. Hear your beautiful, beautiful voice. So, tell me, did you work out this morning? I did not actually, but I worked out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I've got a 7 a.m. session tomorrow. So, okay. four out of five days this week, not too bad. And what is your workout routine? So, I do strength training three times a week, and I'm trying to incorporate at least two cardio days in. Okay. Because what my trainer tells me all the time is, Corey, you would look the way you want to look if you would frankly just do the cardio and stop complaining about it. So that is the new thing for me. It's I've got to work in at least a couple of days a week of sort of hardcore hit or cardio work. So that's my that's my new goal. And when you say cardio work and you say hit, I mean, you, you're not just trapping yourself on the prison of the treadmill, right? Are no. You, are you running up a mountain and I, doing some cool stuff? I, You know, we have not exactly determined what the specific program will look like as of yet, but I'm thinking we're doing a little combination of things to keep me interested, whether it's uh, doing some boot camps or perhaps some spin classes or things of that nature, but I'm really going to try to switch it up because when you don't like cardio naturally, you have to find ways to keep yourself interested. So I think we're going to try to do something pretty dynamic. Very cool. Yeah. And, and tell me about, I know that you spent a lot of time in Tempe. <laughs> um, I, you know, it's part of the job. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what do you walk around Tempe Town Lake? Do you like, do you enjoy the, you know what I'm saying? The atmosphere. I love it down there. Oh, I, I do. I actually live right in the heart of downtown Tempe. I mean, I can walk to work in under five minutes. And there are many days when I don't get in my car at all, where the majority of my meetings are in the general vicinity, and I just walk everywhere. So I'm regularly on Mill Avenue, walking around Town Lake, and really, and, and frankly, it was for the reason of I wanted to really take it all in. Yeah. I wanted to kind of visualize and really feel the evolution of Mill Avenue and kind of where it's going, or the Mill and Lake District, as we like to talk about. And so quite honestly, living down there and walking out my front door every day and seeing everything right in front of me is the best way to experience it, but it's also the best way to make change because you know what needs to be adjusted. Yeah, because yeah, you're in it and you're seeing it and it all, exactly. all kind of happens. So here's my cardio suggestion for you. And Please. Brie, right? Yes. Okay. Get Brie some tennis shoes. Okay. Right? <clears throat> and then you do all of your phone calls while you're walking around Tempe Town Lake. And before you know it, you got like 20,000 steps. <laughs> huh? How cool is that? You know what? It's true. Though, but, you know, but to that point, a lot of our work is done while sort of doing other things. You know, you go to breakfast or lunch, and yeah. you're still kind of going through calls and emails and checking your calendar and things of that nature. And quite honestly, you have to find a way to make the job fun. I mean, it's sometimes it's, you don't want to just sit in front of a computer you find ways to kind of multitask and but still get all the work done at the same time. Well, let, let's talk about that. I mean, yeah. meetings, meetings, more meetings. Everybody wants to meet with you. Yay. And and thanks for taking the time to come to uh, my Of course, of course. I, I, it, it, it's funny how people become friends over the years and, and the mutual um, components of friendships and things that happen. But my question is, how many breakfasts, how many lunches, and what does your trainer say to that? And what do you, what, what's your infrastructure structure inside of your brain that goes, okay, logically, I know I'm going to have to go to Butterfields today and I just can't, I, I can't do the pancakes right now. Right. So what do you order? How do you order? And what do you do? That is the toughest part is the fact that there are many days where I have breakfast, lunch, and dinner <laughs> all out. And so it's not a matter of me doing meal prep at the beginning of a week and then bringing in my Tupperware container and heating it up and eating everything that I know that's measured out from a portion size standpoint or macros or things. So it is a little bit hard, but I try to do things, I skew more towards a high protein, low carb diet when I can't really control my food. So in the morning, I might go and have a couple of scrambled egg whites and maybe a side of chicken sausage, maybe some avocado or something else of that nature that's green. Uh, I try to have a salad at lunch with some kind of protein on top and a lighter dressing in oil or vinegar or kind of an Italian vinaigrette. And then for dinner, I try to follow generally the same kind of pattern. It's try to do some kind of lean meat and and, uh, heavy on the vegetables and maybe some complex carbs somewhere in there. The challenge I've had for years is that when I was a kid, I ate a lot of candy. Yeah. Like a lot. Yeah. And the problem is it kind of like hardwires your brain in such a way where that's just sort of what you want. So for me, cutting out the sugar has been like that final thing that I've had to do to really get the physique that I want to obtain. But look, you got to put in the work if that's what you want. Yeah. No, you do. And so that lends to the fact that, you know, hey, I'm, I'm 
oh, there's the mayor over there. Let's send him over a dessert. And you're like, oh, yeah. God. So are you obligated to eat that dessert? Uh, you know, I would say <laughs> I, I wouldn't say obligated, but the problem is I want the dessert. That's the issue. It's right. not, you know, I mean, well, you know, pass it over to Bree. <laughs> but, but I will tell you a funny thing. Like, I actually, one of the things, I'm not a huge chocolate fan. So, like, chocolate cake and chocolate. So a lot of the dinners you go to as a mayor or a council member, you chocolate tends to be the dessert. It's like, oh, here's this chocolate mousse or here's a chocolate cake. And sometimes I will tell you secretly, and I guess not so secretly because I'm talking about it right now, yeah. <laughs> if that's what the dessert is, I'm able to push it away and go, I just don't really like that. Yeah. So so when I get the chocolate dessert at the uh, at the large dinner at one of the bigger hotels, uh, that's actually a good evening because I can push the dessert away and not actually absorb those extra calories. And just have that cup of coffee. And, and, and be done with it. Yeah. Exactly. Can you drink coffee at night? I don't drink coffee at all, actually. At all? Okay. Which is shocking to a lot of people. They're like, how in the world do you have this much energy? Yeah. But uh, I kind of, you know, waking up and getting my workout on, that's sort of what, get, what kind of gets me energized, quite honestly. And I do a lot of my best thinking at night. Mm. Uh, I come home in the evening and I'm still sort of thinking about what I experienced during the day because during the day, many times you're just doing things. Yeah. You don't have time to really sit around and think about what did I do today mm. and how do I strategically approach tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. So for me personally, that is where a a lot of my best thinking happens is probably after eight o'clock in the evening when I'm finally home from everything else and I have an opportunity to really sit down and be one with myself and think intentionally about what I really want to get accomplished both in the near and the long term future. It's I absolutely love it. I mean, have you always been this organized and, and this and, and this fit and like you know structural? Because you're very Type A, like I am. Yeah. So I yeah. get it. I, everything that you're saying. So I, I was a fat blob at one point. I was 190 pounds. I'm 146 yeah. right now. Right. See. So I was at my heaviest though. I was about 205 when I first got sworn in to the council when I was 29 years old back okay. in 2008, and now I'm at 167. So I mean, I lost about 35 to 40 pounds during the time. And actually, the fitness journey started in a very interesting way. It didn't start during my eight years on the city council between 2008 and 2016. It was actually when I left the city council in July of 2016, because I ended up signing up to be in a charity boxing match. Mm. Uh, and so I, I had a <laughs> boxing match with a school board member from Tolleson, and I made a decision. Wait, wait that's a thing? It was a thing. Wait, we were a school board member? You're boxing? We were raising money for, for a nonprofit 501c3 that was basically teaching kids to box to make sure that they weren't getting involved in street life and things of that nature and yeah. teaching them a skill and a technique. And so I made the decision that I was going to be part of this boxing match. So my thought process at the time was, well, either I bulk, because he was 10 years younger than me and about 50, 60 pounds heavier. Yeah. And so my thought process was, well, either I'm going to bulk up to try to match him power for power or I'm going to lose some weight so I can be a lot quicker and more nimble as I sort of have to move around for three rounds. And that's what actually got me started in terms of losing weight. I was taking boxing classes and doing a lot of cardio and a lot of strength training, and about 27, 28 pounds came off like that. I mean, it was, and but once yeah. I lost all the weight, I recognized how much better I felt. Right. My knees weren't bothering me. I wasn't huffing and puffing, walking up the stairs. And I just generally said, this is how I really want to feel. So how do I make permanent lifestyle choices that allow me to live my best life? And that was sort of how it happened. Well, a couple of things. I agree with you about the sugar. That's one of my biggest um, <clears throat> downfalls for sure. And and I will I will absolutely derail probably twice a month where I went with my trainer, so it was legit, right? If you go with your trainer somewhere, it's okay. So we went and had like two pizzas each, and then I had I went over to um, what was it? Uh, I can't remember the place, but anyways, they had these big pies. These, I think I saw photos of this online. Yeah, you did. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so th they had big chocolate. I had a piece of big chocolate pie. I'm not. I'm not kidding. It was this big. Right. Right. Um, Zen burger. Oh yeah. For what they had these great pies and right. then another piece of banana. And we we went and ordered dessert separately from dinner. So right. we we had dinner one place and the pies at the other place. We walk in. She's like, What would you have? Well, two each of the pies. She's like, Are you kidding me? And everybody around us is watching these two you know fit people. My right. trainer is like shredded. Right. You know. Right. And uh, we're just stuffing our face with pies and people are probably looking at us like, Is that how you do it? Well, you know, but if, but if they teach you, if you can get your, your metabolism up to a certain level, 
yeah, you can you can do that for a, a yeah. day or two, and it's not going to have a huge impact. And that's my goal in trying to incorporate a lot more cardio into my workout regimen. And so I actually can cheat a little bit every now and then and not feel the after effect so much. Uh, but no, I, I have the same thing. I mean, I'll go to a, I have tons of dessert weaknesses. I mean, you know, bread pudding, rice pudding, bread pudding. I Who love eats br bread pudding. I eat bread pudding, oh D'Lo. I Who love bread, bread pudding. pudding. And you know, and you know Is why? That's a thing. Well, he, he, because you know, here's what it was. Here's where my love for it came. <laughs> it was when I was in college doing my undergrad work at the University of Michigan, yep. and I would come home for the holidays, and my mother would make bread pudding. And she would leave it on the counter Fair for me. Fair enough. It's love. And so it, it, so I love the taste itself, but it's also a memory of my mother. So it's like, so I have a very emotional connection to the world of bread pudding. But uh, I get but, it. But red, I mean, red velvet cake, carrot cake, angel cookies, food cake, angel gingerbread. Oh, uh, I love, I love all of it. Yeah, that, yeah. that is my biggest problem. I just, I love sugar. But as I've gotten <laughs> older, I have learned to do it in much more uh, moderation, but also to sort of use it as a special treat, not as an everyday kind of occurrence. Correct. Like a, a reward for, yeah, you know. exactly. But you love the healthy foods, too. You love the way that you feel when you have a piece of salmon. Yeah. When we went out to lunch, right. you you wanted to you know, eat healthy, and right. so did I. Well, because at some point, too, you get into a situation where when you start eating poorly again, you feel terrible. 100%. I mean, your stomach begins to hurt, and you feel like going to take a nap, and you're thinking you to yourself. You can't produce it. You can't produce. Your brain isn't yeah. firing you know, the way that it should. And so you start saying, I don't want to go back to that. I don't want to go back to having brain fog. I don't want to be tired. I don't want my stomach to hurt when I've got four hours left of work in front of me. And for me, obviously, many times I'm working until 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night. And so if I'm eating a bad lunch at noon, and I start feeling sick around 1 o'clock, yeah. i got six, seven more hours to go. I can't just go home and lay on the couch. So for me, really eating healthy makes me feel better, but it's also imperative given the schedule that I keep, which is pretty much insane. Yeah. And, and you're old. I mean, you're 45, <laughs> 40, 50. Yeah. yeah. So the thing is, is like, since this has turned into a total dessert podcast, let's just go down. There this we go. Road. Let's keep going. What are your top three like candies? Cause they got to be in relation to mine. I only got five years. On so this. my, my all time favorite are Reese's peanut butter cups. <laughs> I mean, I am still at a place where if you so leave good. those things, the minis on people's desks as I walk around the office, I will fish through it and go through everything else. They're like, uh, past the Tootsie Rolls, past the, the Snickers corns. bars or the candy corn or the Three Musketeers, and I will go right for that uh, that little mini Reese's peanut butter cup in that gold foil. So that, that, that is my clear number one. Uh, also connected to my mother, I love Twizzlers. Okay. So I will typically eat them if I go to a movie. And I don't go to tons of movies. Not but the black licorice one, so. No, yeah. no, but she <laughs> She actually really liked those, but yeah. no, I'm, I'm a straight up red licorice guy. Yeah. Um, so uh, red, but I and I'm and yes, it's a Twizzlers over Red Vines. Yeah, I can eat Red Vines, but they're not my favorite. The Twizzlers are my favorite. Do you still have all your teeth? Uh, yeah, uh, well, yeah. I mean, you know, they're all there. I think as of the last time I checked, which is about probably 15, 20 minutes ago. So, but uh, but yeah, it's it's um, but that's you know, but right over over time, you begin to recognize that I also didn't like the sugar crash. Yeah. That's the other thing. I mean, you find that you're you eat a lot of sugar, you feel very good for about 30 minutes when you sort of hopped up on all this stuff, and then for whatever reason, about 45 minutes later, an hour later, you kind of begin to come down. Yeah. And I don't like that feeling because I'm in meetings at two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock like five o'clock and I have to really have a sustained amount of energy to live the lifestyle that I do and to do all, perform all of my job functions. Well, you're doing a great job of it. I follow you, you on social. I love watching you work. I think it's very important to be able to, and, and I do this and I know you follow my stuff. I'll write my workouts. It's accountability. I mean, if yeah. anything, social media can really be used as a positive benefit to ourselves and to show others, you know, uh, the positivity of the things that we're doing. And right. I have a lot of people that reach out to me and I'm sure you do as well that are like, wow, you know, thanks for showing me that. That's really motivated me. You made, you yeah. know, you made my day better. You made me smile, you know, mm -hmm. and that's cool. You yeah. know, we can make good things. I had breakfast with someone, uh, see, shocking again, on Tuesday, <laughs> and he actually said to me, and I've actually heard this from a lot of people, I, I really like to cook, but being mayor has sort of stopped a lot of that because I find myself eating out a lot more or yeah. I just simply don't have time. And so uh, he said to me at breakfast, you used to always post photos 
photos of all the food that you were making at home and specifically on Sundays. It shocks me the number of people who remember that I was always cooking on Sundays and posting all of the videos or all the photos and all the ingredients I was using and the steps and the process. Yeah. And people really kind of latched on to it. Like, you know, actually, I really want to cook more at home now. You're watching your Facebook page has gotten me interested in making more meals at home right. and not going out as much. And I, I mean, I didn't do it for the purpose of trying to start any trend or trying to be internet famous, but interesting things sort of catch on. I mean, I would, I would bump into people at the grocery store and they would say, so what are you making this Sunday? Yeah. And I was like, what am I making? Yeah, you actually follow that? And, and, but they do. But you are a human that's putting your personality out there and people are getting to know you in a contextual way that is fun and authentic. And so when you do hold a public position like what you do, what you see is what you get. Right. You know? Absolutely. And, and, and look, I'm not mayor or, or anything else. I'm just d that has a shitload of clients in hospitality. But those clients get to know me year after year just right. through social. I, right. can't, I can't go see everybody every right. week. Right. But I can see them through social, yeah. whether like, oh, that's so cool that you're doing this. Or Absolutely. Or for this and that. So it's fun. It is fun. And I think uh, one of the things that I started doing with my, a lot of my socials back in the day, and I've been a little bit slower on it more recently, but it was really talking about what you just said, being a human. Because many times when you're an elected official, people treat you as if you're kind of a robot. Yeah. It's like, well, you know, I can yell at you and scream at you and say horrible, nasty things that I would never say to a family member or a friend or a neighbor. But because you ran for mayor or ran for city council or school, school board or whatever it is, you can just handle it. Like, you're a two-dimensional yeah, person, not cool. and none of this bothers you. I'm like, I'm a human being. If you say that I'm terrible at my job or I'm the worst mayor the city of Tempe ever has, I mean, that definitely hurts me. I mean, I'm in the office five days a week. I'm working around the clock trying to make the city a better place and trying to position it for a bright future. Yeah. And so if you tell me that I'm awful, yeah, that hurts me, quite honestly. So you care. I care. I, I care, and I have a lot of passion for the work that I do, and I care about this community, and I care about the people who are in it. And so, but, so, but I do try to use a lot of the social media or some of the things that I do when I'm meeting with people one-on-one -on -one or in groups to really show people my actual personality. Yeah. Because I want people to go, that he's a real person. He's not just the mayor. He's not some guy who's an elected official or a name on a sign. He's Corey Woods, the human being, and I want people to treat me that way. Well, and you take care of yourself, which means that, again, you're putting your oxygen mask on first. Mm -hmm. And then you're able to help others. Absolutely. And that, that goes a long way because, you know, people that seem to be very um, just kind of lazy in their own lives tend to have a little bit laziness in business, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and mm -hmm. that's a, it just is what it is. So that's great. I, I, I did want to ask you, you know, being from the University of Michigan and, and graduating from there and then coming to, you know, being now in Arizona, what, what, is, what does Arizona mean to you? So I've been in Arizona now for 21 years. I came here in 2003 to go to graduate school at ASU and thought I was going to be here for a couple of years and get a master's degree and then go somewhere else to get a PhD. But I really fell in love with Arizona and more specifically Tempe. Yeah. And so for me, Arizona means everything. I mean, it's been my home now for over two decades. I cannot imagine living anywhere else. All 21 of those years have been in Tempe. Uh, I think I've lived in every zip code. I've, I've lived out in three of the five now zip codes in Tempe, but I, but I just love it, yeah. and 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 I just want to see my community do well, but I want to see Maricopa County do well. I want the entire state of Arizona to do well. I want to see nothing but positive headlines and positive things about what we're doing. And so that's really what I work towards every day. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I graduated in 96 from ASU, same time Tillman. I had class with Tillman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what an honor. It was so cool. Absolutely. <clears throat> that dude was smart, by the way. Yeah. Like, really smart. Most certainly was. I'm just a big dummy that, you know, sells insurance, but this guy was smart. Um, but yeah, I mean, just to watch the... Um, um, everything down in, in Tempe and, and all of it be built up over the years and, and to be a part of this and be so proud of it. And it, it's it's really cool. And a lot of people that come out here are very transient, yeah. but they stay here. Mm -hmm. they, right. They literally stay here. Absolutely. And we have a growing economy. We have a lot of great stuff going on. And as you probably know, I've been a, a co-owner in some establishments on Mill Avenue with Julian. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just been it's been a great place to, to be a part of. And it's only like I just drove down there just the other day. Yeah. And it's like, wow, Yeah, everything's always changing. It is. It is. And it's, and it's going to continue to evolve over time. There are new restaurants and new bars coming in, like you mentioned, Julian, and 
you know, him just opening up Devil's Hideaway in yeah. the old Rula Bula space. And I know he's got plans for other concepts as well. Uh, but that's my big thing. It's, it's I, I like to embrace the evolution. Um, I, it, you know, it looks, Mill Avenue looks a lot different and Tempe looks a lot different than it did 21 years ago when I first got here. Yeah. You didn't have all the class A office in the downtown. You didn't have all the, the multifamily or all the hotels. And now you've got all of this stuff going on. I mean, from the, the Omni Hotel to the Canopy to the Westin to, you know, the Mission Palms that's been there for a long time. You have Mirabella at ASU. Yeah. You've got lots of multifamily in and around the downtown, beautiful office buildings everywhere. And so the fact of the matter is you have a very different population and a very different set of demographics downtown than you had 15, 20 years ago. So because of that, you are going to continue to see that downtown environment evolve. But frankly, I think that's a good thing. I think that places that don't evolve die. Yeah. And I definitely don't want to be the leader of a city that's dying. And so we're going to continue to move forward and continue to move forward in a positive fashion. I love that. I love it. Um, and thank you for that. That's very cool. Um, OK, you're fresh out of college. You have $100,000 in the bank, and you're going to start a business. What are you starting? Ooh, um, I would probably start at a apparel company. Like, cause I, I I like workout clothes. Okay, okay, hold on. Funny story. We get done having lunch. Oh, I know where this is going. And I'm staring at the mayor's ass, right? And not because it's cute, but it is. Um, and the, his pants. I'm like, dude, where did you get these pants? And so he's showing me the pants, and I went right online and ordered them. And I, dude, I ordered like six pairs. They're the best. Because they're amazing pants. Because they're amazing. Okay, they're amazing. Your apparel company. Sorry. No, but, but 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 that's why. But it's like you know, and and. and and part of why I bought those pants <clears throat> was primarily because, you know, you need stuff if, if I'm things I could actually go to the office in, but also go out in the evening and transition from a more business environment to a more casual environment, environment seamlessly without having to go home and change and do multiple clothing changes during the course of the day. So I would probably start some kind of an apparel company. But, but the problem at this point is the athleisure market is very much saturated with a lot of brands for both men and women. I mean, between your Lululemons and your right. Viore's and Public Rec and Roan and all these companies. So there's probably no space for me right now with all of that. But honestly, but hey, I'll just keep buying their clothes because they're awesome. That's uh, that's amazing. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you, too, is what are some of your <clears throat> non-negotiable during the days and what are some of your hobbies? And when I say non-negotiables, like what do you have to do every day or is you, you just go nuts? Eat lunch. OK. Uh, that's, that's one of my things. I, I have to... If I find myself, you know, not eating during the day, I will end up getting kind of hangry and getting frustrated. So I have to carve out at least 45 minutes to an hour at some point, probably between that 11 and 2 o'clock time period to put something in my body. Yeah. Uh, because otherwise, I mean, I could very easily just schedule meetings through the entire day and never stop. I mean, there's always something that I could be doing, whether it's, you know, answering an email or a text message or a phone call or having a one-on-one -on -one meeting or speaking to a group. But, I mean, I find that... Part of it is just sort of the self-care aspect of you have to take care of yourself. Because yeah. you said before about adjusting your own mask before you can help someone with theirs. If, if you are not in a good space, both mentally and physically, you can't be of any assistance to other people because you're, you're dragging yourself. And so for me, that is one of my non-negotiables during the day is at some point between that 11 and 2 time period, we have to stop, take a deep breath, and eat lunch. Even if that means we're still working as a team. Yeah. I might be sitting around with my team going to lunch and we're going over you know, calendaring appointments. And, and, you know, constituents I need to respond to and meetings that we want to schedule. But the fact that but we're still finding some time to talk to one another and, frankly, to just to take a little bit of breath and get some sustenance. Yeah, I uh, I think the way to your heart is lunch. Yeah. Right. Oh, absolutely. Oh, food, food, is food is food is absolutely a love language for someone like me. I mean, the fact of the matter is I I am a diehard foodie. It's one of the ways that you and I both met is that you're, you're into the restaurant industry in yeah. a, a, a very different way than I am. But I, I'm I'm just a connoisseur. I love it. For sure. I am all about finding new and interesting places to go eat. And I also love to make sure that I'm supporting, you know, local people who are doing great things in the bar and restaurant business to make sure that I'm yeah. spending my dollars in those local establishments. So for me, really, it is it, it is a thing. Like I, most of the best conversations I have with people and the best ideas that we've ever hatched together have been over food. And so it's a cultural thing for me. The, the, the whole... <clears throat> The whole rhetoric around localism is absolutely beautiful. I love Arizona. I was born here. I mean, Kimber Landing is one of my best friends from when I was 18, and yeah. now I'm 50. You guys can do the math. Um, 
I, all of it is is just beautiful. I mean, we just lost, you know, a very close friend of, of mine, and and I'm sure yours, and, and he sat right there in that chair and yep. did this podcast with me, you know, Robin, and, yeah. you know, it, it just, it, it, when community is so built together like it is out here, and you have all of that, it's it's just a, it's an amazing feeling, Absolutely. you know, and, and to be able to count on each other and just be, you know, kind of one, and, and it's funny because people will look on social media and other things, and they think the world's coming apart, and right. I have a complete opposite opinion of that. Me I think too. the world's together. Me I think too. the world's about hugs, you know? Yeah. Because when you do this sort of thing, it's beautiful. Yeah. You know? I mean, I find that we generally as people have more that brings us together than actually separates yeah. us. And if we spent more time focusing on that, it would overall, it would, we just have a better society and a better culture overall. So that's what I try to focus on. Whenever I'm even in a conversation with a resident and if they're kind of going at a place of all of the things that divide us or sort of the divide they think exists between, you know, the average constituent and a member of council, I try to say, well, probably we agree on probably eight out of 10 things. Right. So why are we spending so much time on that 20%? Let's try to talk about the things that actually bring us together, where we can actually sit down and find ways to collectively move this community forward in a positive fashion. Yeah. And let's not sit around talking about that 10 or 20%. And if we are going to talk about that 10 or 20%, let's try to do it respectfully. Yeah. Let's try to, you know, I will, I will understand where you're coming from. I may not sway you over to my side, but I'm not here to try to convince you. Yeah. I just want to respect, I want to have a conversation. And frankly, talking to people many times who don't share my same political or social views helps me to kind of broaden my horizons a little bit quite. It, it makes me think about things that I might not otherwise think about if I was only hanging out with people that agreed with me 100% of the time. So I have friends who agree with me more times than not, but I have friends who also don't. But all of them enrich my, li my life, and all of them have frankly contributed to making me a better person. And yeah. I think, frankly, a better elected official. That's, <clears throat> that's beautifully said. Absolutely love that. Um, I, I would be remiss not to allow you to have a little bit of a platform about some of the wonderful things that you've done. I know that, um, you know, Hometown for All. Yes. One is, so do you want to talk about that just a little bit? And so Hometown for All was sort of a response to trying to find a way to create a sustainable, dedicated revenue stream to create more affordable and attainable housing in Tempe. Yeah. And because when I first started as mayor, it was a very big priority of mine. But I just, I didn't want to be a person up there saying, I care about affordable housing. And then residents saying, yeah, but where's the money to actually see that that commitment can be followed through on? And so I said, we got to figure something out. So we spent about two or three weeks between myself and members of our staff coming up with what became the Hometown for All plan. Uh, it got passed in late January of 2021 unanimously by the council at the time. We've, we've raised millions of dollars uh, as part of that effort. And we're making continued investments to create more affordable housing in our community. As a matter of fact, on April 25th, we are going to have a bond question that we're going to uh, more than likely refer to voters. I'm pretty confident that it will go through. I never want to speak for my council beforehand, but I'm pretty confident knowing who they are about where this vote's going to go. But I mean, it's a $32 million bond question to create more affordable housing opportunities for people in our community, our nurses and our teachers and people working in the service industry. And I think it's really, it's really critically important to making sure that we maintain the diversity and the inclusive spirit that really defines Tempe and has yeah. for quite some time. So uh, I'm really excited about the Hometown for All program. I'm excited about the things that we have planned on the affordable housing front, and I'm going to keep working on it. That's great, man. Cheers to you. I love it. Absolutely love it. Um, <clears throat> one other thing I, I did want to ask you before I get into rapid fire questions. You're you're out there. You talk to a lot of people. What is some advice you could give to somebody that you know has a small business to you know just to kind of let it marinate with them, just based on your experiences and what you've seen and what tools and resources might be possible for them? I would say networking is very important. I mean, the ability yeah. to join your local chamber of commerce, talk to other people that operate businesses that are very similar or like the one uh, that you're looking to open or you've just started up, because they might have tips and tricks that might actually help you be successful in the near and the long term. Uh, but I also think the networking thing is really critical. I mean, I think it's also it's very important to be in spaces with people who understand the experience that you're going through as an entrepreneur or a small business owner. And so quite honestly, I think that, you know, in Tempe, you know, joining your local chamber of commerce, joining organizations like Local First Arizona, I think that really is critically important to not only gaining the knowledge you need to be a successful small business owner, but also, frankly, to have the, the network working in place to just be able to socialize and share ideas and concepts with other like-minded people. That's, that's great, man. It's, it's a book out of my page as well, because 
relationships are everything. Yeah. You know, and if you create relationships and you put the time in, and as I explained to the the young ones in the room, um, the thing is, is that. When I was in my 20s, 30s, I was always out. I was at every local first, you know, function, every restaurant association yeah. function, everything to build my business. But I got to know people. I right. got to know who yeah. they were, what made them resonate, and, and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. So, yeah. I Absolutely. Love that, love that advice. Um, okay. You ready for some rapid fire questions? Let's do it. All right. This is fun. <clears throat> okay. Are you going to ask a friend to help you to move, or are you going to call movers? I'll call movers. Okay. Good. Yeah. I, I like that. <laughs> run or ruck? Run or ruck? Yeah. Run. Okay. Yeah. All right. Definitely run. And there's no wrong answer. No, I know. I was, just, I was trying to make sure I, I yeah. totally understood. So, yeah. I'm going to pick run. <laughs> uh, beard or no beard? Beard. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. You know, as a matter of fact, when I ran for mayor, uh, I talked to a number of people who told me, uh, who said, Corey, you look very young. Like, yeah. you always have. It might be 46 in December, but that people said, I don't look 46. So one of the things they told me was, you really should keep the beard, because it actually gives you a little bit more age and a little bit more gravitas with people who might be looking at you thinking, I don't want to hand the mm. city of Tempe over to this kid. But having the kind of little salt and pepper beard action, frankly, was probably helpful. So I took their advice, and I've kept it ever since. That, that's... Yeah, when I grew up, mine is way gray. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm well on that path, Getting trust there? me. Trust me. <laughs> uh, Mesa or Chandler? Oh, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> sushi. Uh, sushi or tacos? Ooh, um... I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go sushi. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I, I love fish. Yeah. Um, fish is one of my. I, mean, I love tacos as well, uh, and I frequent lots of the taco <laughs> places around Tempe on a very consistent basis. Such a problem. But, but I love sushi. Fish is fish is sort of my thing. I I, yeah. I I could probably. I mean, I eat everything, but I could probably be a pescatarian. Really? I could probably give up eating red meat, and if I just had lots of fish uh, as part of my diet. So for that reason and that reason alone. I've got to say sushi. Yeah, Mediterranean, baby. Yeah. Uh, Sasquatch or the Loch Ness Monster? Ooh, um, Loch Ness Monster. All right. I, I just remember a lot of you know conversations more so about the Loch Ness Monster from when I was a child. So uh, yeah, I got to go with Loch Ness. Okay, fair enough. Um, Penn State or Notre Dame? <laughs> Ooh, uh, Penn State. Okay. Uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers or Nirvana? Nirvana. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, that smells like Teen Spirit. I mean, when that, when that came out, I mean, it was at least in 1991, yeah. I believe. Yeah, you're right. I mean, everyone, everyone had that album. There are certain albums that will, frankly, really cross over in such a major way. When, and you know, because there are people who typically won't listen to that kind of music specifically, but who have that album and seemingly still know all the words. I knew guys who didn't listen to anything sort of out of Seattle or kind of yeah. grunge, or, but they knew every word to Nirvana's Nevermind. So no, I mean, for me, that was a really iconic album and it really sticks out. So let's talk about that real quick before we head out. I, I just wrote about this in a new book that I just wrote. And the thing is, is that when you take something like music and you're able to listen to it and close your eyes and put yourself back into that time and back into that good memory mm -hmm. you think about all the old albums yep. and you know like for me last night like I told you I was at the Black Crows right. and you know if I take like their albums from the you know the, the early 90s and, mm -hmm. and listen to that music mm -hmm. it brings me to a happy space and yeah. I, think that, I think that's what music does for a lot of people. It does and you know what the funny thing about that is when I was young I remember giving my dad a really hard time because he spent all this time, my dad's 84. Yeah. And so he spent a lot of time listening to old doo wop music and Motown right. and things of that nature. And I remember saying, like, I like this stuff. This is actually really, I have a real affinity for it myself. But, like, why don't you ever listen to anything new? that's on the radio or what's on the sort of the top 40 charts right now. And he said, Corey, at some point, you're probably going to get like me. Yep. You're going to simply go back to the things that you liked from when you were in high school or in college or media. And it acts, it totally has. It totally makes it sense. It totally now. has yeah. happened. I think probably for me, it was in my very early 30s when I recognized that I get in the car 
and I throw on Spotify, and I'm just sort of clicking on liked songs and just shuffling them. Yeah. And in order for me to, to listen to something new, it either, one, has to be one of my favorite artists. So anything they put out, I will probably listen to. Yep. Or someone has to literally beg me to listen to it. They have to say, have you heard this yet? Have you heard this? And I'm like, I don't want to hear that. Yeah. Like, no, 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 Court, you need to hear it. And it takes them, and then finally I will relent. And many times I will <laughs> like it because that person probably knows my taste. But right, I'm very hesitant now about listening to new artists or new music because I, because my comfort zone is just the stuff that I grew up on right. and the stuff that takes me back to an instant happy place. It gives you the feels. It does. That's great. Okay, last question. Skydive or um, uh, campaigning for money? <laughs> I'm going to actually have to say campaigning for money because I've, I've actually never done any skydiving in my life, and I don't think I'm going to do any uh, anytime soon. I'm a little bit too uh, type A for that. So. A little too crazy, right? A little, little, little too crowded. I don't like taking my life in my own hands. That's funny. Well, this has been fun. Before we go, is there anything that you want to mention or say? Or No, just that, just that I appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's good to see you again, and I'm glad I finally got a chance to do the podcast. Yeah, thanks for coming to the office and saying hi, and I'm glad that we're friends, and this is just a lot of fun stuff. So thank you, everybody for listening to another episode of On the D-Lo. I hope you enjoyed it. Please subscribe and give it a five star. Don't be lazy. And yeah, um, until next time, we'll see you later. Peace out.